Amen. Okay, get out your Bibles, turn over to Joshua chapter 1. We're going to be, I did have that down, and I just went right by it. So let me just go ahead and say, I know how many chapters are in Joshua, just so you all know that. I had a good laugh in staff this week, because as soon as it came out of my mouth, I kept saying it too, I like said it three times over, there's 14 chapters, there was a four, that's right, there's 24 chapters, but my buddy Nathan over here, he was on it, man. He was texting like, nope, nope, you got that wrong. So uh, 24 chapters, we're not going to go through week by week, although the first three weeks we are camping out one week on each chapter because there are just some great stories there. But before I get to that, today is officially, really yesterday was, but today is officially Wes and Kim Gibson. Stand up, guys. Their first official... They are on the clock, baby, so uh, they are working. They are going to be leading our capital city region. We're grateful to have them here. They moved from Denver, Colorado. That's not an easy move either, uh, but hopefully they are reasonably settled in, and um, particularly the folks in capital city get ready to spend some time with them because that's what they're going to be doing. Great, great to have them and to have folks now, you know, put in place where I think the church is going to continue to grow. It looks awesome. All right, so we started last week. We're calling this series Entering the Promised Land. Um, today, we're going to zero in on chapter one, but let me go back and just review a couple, two or three things to make sure we remember these things. What I think is super important, when you pick up the book of Joshua, you need to remember that God is working through a nation. God doesn't do that today. Let me let that settle in a second. God doesn't do that today. God works through his church today. He reveals himself through the church. America is not God's favored nation. Some people don't think that's true. But if you want to see God, look at his church. But in this day and time, if you wanted to see God, you looked at his people, the nation of Israel. So when we pick this book up, like we talked about last week, you got to keep that in its context. However, there are fantastic things for us to learn as we go through this book. And we went through four Major themes in the book. Number one, there's a difference in surviving and being victorious. To this point, God's people had survived, but they weren't living the life God wanted them to. Secondly, Jesus is pictured in the book of Joshua. Joshua's name means Jesus or Savior. And you'll see Jesus in about three times this morning where you go, oh, that's just a picture of Jesus right there is all that is. Thirdly, God gives, but sometimes it is a struggle to possess. And boy, we're going to see that throughout the book of Joshua. God says, it's yours, but sometimes we got to get up and do something. And then finally, it is a story of triumph for those who are faithful to God. Okay, that's, we're going to see those themes almost every week. Today, we're going into Joshua chapter 1. Turn there. I started with this verse last week. I'm going to read it again. I just think it's funny. Uh, then we're going to go back and get just a little bit of history to that. All right. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, Moses... My servant is dead. <laughs> just, God is so obvious sometimes. It's just so funny. He just goes to Joshua and he says, he's dead, all right? He, it's as if he is saying, he's dead. He's not coming back. So I got something for you, which is going to bring us to the first point this morning. The first thing that I think we need to understand is this. Moses's will always need a Joshua. Now you want to agree, uh, read, well, let's just go do it for a second. It's the same page you're open to, all right? Deuteronomy 34, 
We'll start in verse five. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died. I love this part. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. May that be said of those of us who are getting a little older. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all the miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to the whole land, for no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. How would you like to replace Moses? Because God himself just said, nobody's done it like Moses. And, and God comes to, jo, uh, to, to Joshua and he says, Joshua, Moses is dead. You and I need to talk. Moseses will always need a Joshua. Somebody has to take your place. Now, you may be looking at this and going, oh, I'm no Moses. I'm not even a Joshua. Why, I'm hardly anything in this church. I don't even know if there's people in this church that know my name. Well, I will assure you of this. There is something that God has uniquely given you. Isn't that what Paul preached? Romans 12, that he's gifted every one of us. They may look different, but there is something that God has uniquely gifted you to give to this church. And when you are dead and gone, somebody's got to take your place. So what I'm going to do in each of the things we're going to talk about this morning, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to leave with five questions today. And the first question this morning is this, who is your Joshua. Or if you want to put it in the New Testament context, who's your Timothy to Paul? Now, you can't do that if you don't know what your gift is. It's hard to, to raise up a replacement and to say, this, this is my Timothy, this is my Joshua to take my place when I'm gone because my gift is important to this church. It's there. You may not have figured it out yet, but that's one of the challenges. Joshua is about to figure out what it means to lead God's people, and he's been under one of the greatest leaders ever. And God's going to have to tell him over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Stop being afraid. Be courageous. We'll get to that in just a second. Why? Because I'm not Moses. So this morning, question number one, who is your Joshua? And then we find verse two. Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready. If you're reading several other versions, it says, get up. This is probably an allusion to what we just read in the book of Deuteronomy. When Moses died, what did the people do? They mourned for 30 days. And God let them do that. And he said, okay, there's a time of mourning. That's good, but enough's enough. Now get up. Get ready. Get ready to do something. Do you understand how important that command of God right there is? Remember one of our points about God gives, but it's so hard sometimes to possess the land? It's because we sit. We sit paralyzed. 
And God's people were sitting here and their, their leader had died and they were mourning for 30 days. And it would be so easy and is so easy. And maybe where some of us are this morning, we've been sitting for years. Kind of in the same spot. We could be paralyzed by our own fear. We could just be unsure about where we're headed. We're going into this thing he's calling the promised land, but I don't know what that's going to look. And it's just easier to sit. And God says, listen, if you're going to go to the promised land, you got to get up. You got to get ready. Now let's, Let's maybe take this one more level in a practical way. I believe it's easy to sit and reminisce. We can look back in life and we can think about Moses. We can think about all the great miracles or we can think about what God did in our lives five and 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years ago and the stories of those things and we can sit and Reminisce. And God's people could have done that about Moses, and God said, Get up. Or it's also easy to sit and be pessimistic. It's so easy to do. I don't know why Joshua thinks he could lead us anywhere. He ain't no Moses. And after all, we've been wandering around for 40 years. We'd have been better off if we'd have stayed. But, and you can sit and you can mouth off all the pessimism you want to. And I think God sees that in his people. And he says, Joshua, you and all these people, get ready. Get up. Because you're about to go into the promised land. How many times? Just, is God not able to lead us into the promised land? Because we just won't get up. We're stuck. We're in our seat and we just can't move. And dare somebody come along and try to give us a little nudge out of the seat. Oh. You want to go to the promised land? How about in your marriage? How about in your family? How about all those places in our lives that we wish we were someplace different than get ready and get up? Thirdly, here's what he says. He's going to say this three different times. I want to read them all three. Verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9. Verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people into the inherited, uh, to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. And then finally in verse 9. Have I not commanded you? <laughs> be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Isn't the reason sometimes that we're afraid to get up? It's because we're scared and we're terrified and we lack courage. And doubt gets in our minds and then we just sit right where we are. So three times God comes to Joshua and he says, be a man of courage. Come on, get up, do this for me. And he tells him again, be very courageous. And then a third time, have I not told you? Yeah, like two seconds ago and two before that. You think God's trying to get a message across? Now understand, it was going to take some courage, right? I mean, they are going to take God's people and they're going to start marching through somebody else's land people that worship other gods, and they're going to conquer these people, take over their land, and possess it. And if God is telling me uh, to, to get ready and be courageous, what would you want to be doing? I want to know I got four bazookas, 44 tanks, I got three times as many people as they do, and that's not what God does. 
God looks at our hearts and he says, leave all that other stuff to me. You got what you need in your life to go to the promised land. You just got to get up and be some, have some courage in your life and be courageous. I wonder, church, are we afraid to stand up in our world anymore? A lot of conversations with good ministers, not even just ministers of, you know, our fellowship of churches. I'm talking about conversations with ministers over all kinds, and a lot of guys are saying the same thing. The church has lost its courage. We want to fit into the world. We want the world to like us. And therefore, we're giving the world what it wants. And God forbid if we ever called something sin anymore. Had that conversation with a Baptist preacher here recently. He goes, I don't know about in your church, but if I call sin, anything sin, somebody gets offended. It takes courage to stand up in a world and say, this is just wrong. Now, there are a lot of things we say, murder, that's wrong. Rape, that's wrong. Right? You're with me on those. But sexual immorality before you're married or while you're married or whatever, that's, what is it, church? That's wrong. And homosexuality? It's wrong. Stealing? It's wrong. Are we afraid to say the things that the world is not going to like? The world is immediately going to... We probably just lost 25 people online right then. I'm tuning in to check. Oh, they're gone. X won't go back to that site. Why? Well, I heard something I didn't like. And God says, show some courage. And by the way, remember what we said? One of the themes of the book of Joshua is our Jesus... And the Bible says Jesus came preaching a message of repentance, forgiveness of sins. He's just showing us who Jesus is. Church, we got to think about that. Have we lost our courage to stand up in a world that needs somebody to point to the promised land and say, well, let's go to the next one, verse, verse 7 and 8. Here's how God expounds on this. Notice that this is tucked into, right, as God is saying, be courageous, be courageous, be courageous. He says this, verse 7, be strong and very courageous. There it is. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right. Isn't it funny? Even we use this terminology, the right and the left. We use that in political circles, don't we? He says, do not turn one bit to the right or one bit to the left. Have the courage to stay right there. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. How much Bible comes out of your mouth anymore? Meditate it. Meditate it. Meditate on it. I'll get it right in a minute. Meditate on it day and night. I got to ask, how are your quiet times? Remember I said I was going to give a question. I don't know if I did that in the last one, but I'll go back and get it in a second. But here's my question. Is your Bible study today the best it's ever been? Because God says, meditate on it day and night. And it's become so easy. I know what the answer is. The answer is No. I talk to enough people to go, yeah, I just, I don't study like I used to. God says, you got to have some courage, church. If you're going to make it through this journey to the promised land, I'm giving you the keys. It's not bazookas and tanks. 
It's what's in you. And if my word of God, if you get off that word just a little bit, you're not going to make it. Stay with my word. Is that something the church today needs to hear? Oh, how we want to update, modernize the word and say, hey, God, I'm going to help you out on this one. (laughs) Uh, The way you said that and what you said, now, that's not true today, bro. I I mean, God, uh, uh, you know, you can't say that, God. Mm -mm. That don't work in our society, but it still works in the church. And we got to still be God's people. And we still got to have this courage to look at his word and go, I'm right down the middle, bro. I'm not going to waver one little bit here or one little bit there, even though the world bombards me with ideas and, as Paul said, false philosophies and false teachings and every kind of cunning, crafty. Well, that sounds really good. Yeah. I think so. I like that church. Get ready. Have courage. Obey my word and be careful. I cannot finish though. Well, I'm doing all right. I cannot finish without going to the last part of this story. I just think it is a great picture of the church, but it is one. It's just a cool story in the Old Testament. All right. So if you got that map, bring it up for me. Okay, we're going we're to come to that map in just a second. Let's read this. But to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, you can see that they're all clumped together on that map. You'll see why in a second. Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. The Lord your God is giving you rest and has granted you this land your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, fully armed, must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers until the Lord gives them rest as he has done you, and until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that, ye may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you east of the Jordan towards the sunrise. And then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will fully obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with us, with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you may command them, will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. They were getting the message. They quote God. Now you understand what's happening here. God's people, as we look, put the map back up. God's people, remember we're down here on the Sinai Peninsula beyond the Dead Sea and they're about to come up into the promised land which is mostly all that stuff on the left side, Simeon, Judah, Jerusalem as we make our way up, but they're going to come up the right side where you see where Moabites is and you see Reuben and Gad. They're coming up that side and then they're going to cross the Jordan, overtake Jericho, and it all really begins. Well, you got these guys like the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh. Guess what? As they're making their way up with God's people, they're already in their promised land because that's the route they were taking. And so the, the, the Reubenites, as soon as they're started on this journey, very good, the Reubenites are like, this is awesome. See all this? That's our land. Now, what's the temptation? 
whoa, we're home. We're in the promised land. So see you guys, we're dropping off. Uh, and then we go on up and the Gadites go, guess what? Look at our land. Oh, this is ours. Have fun, guys. Be well fed. Hope it works out for you. But we're home. And then we have the half tribe of Manasseh and God says, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works with my people. Hopefully this is sounding like something. You follow. I know some of you shaking your head like, I know where you're going with this because it's where the Bible goes with it. There is a principle that God is giving us here and that is the needs of the whole come first. It's a principle of God. God says, life's not about you. Life's about my people. And therefore, what does God tell these people they must do? You can leave your wives and your children and your stock in those lands. But all your fighting men, they're going to go through this whole journey. And when everybody is settled into their land, you can go home to your people. And what is church about? Oh, no, I found my place. I, got, I, got, I don't need that. Oh, we do it. We miss the principle. The needs of the whole outweigh mine. And when we approach God, his people, or we approach God's church that way, we're going to mess up. Because we're going to go, well, I don't need that, God. I don't, I don't need to do that. Yeah, but the body needs you to do it because it's what's good for the whole. Yeah, but I'm already, I, you know. No. Church has become so selfish today. And I'm not really talking about here. Although we all have to take some stock and look, I'm talking about the concept of church in America today it's all about you. What can the church do for you? And you take what you want and leave the rest. And God says, you're missing who I am and you're missing a principle of my church. And that's why then Paul comes along and he teaches, you know, everybody's got to give, but you can't say, the left can't say to the right, I don't need that. Or you can't take this over here, maybe something that we would hide and it not be, you know, you know, we would treat it with extra modesty. Or when Paul said what they were doing wrong at the Lord's Supper, all the rich people were coming in and eating up all the food because the poor people were having to work. And he says, that's not the Lord's Supper you're taking because you missed the idea. The whole outweighs you. And there's a living example. The nation of Israel, as they're taking the promised land, God says, oh, no, 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 guys. Here's how it works with me. You got to have your brothers back. You got to have your sisters back. You're going all the way to the fighting end. Then you can come back and get yours. Wow. If we just understood and practiced that, even in God's church, how much that would change us. That's why we read stories like this, guys. That's why the New Testament writers said, these things were written for your learning because they're principles about God. They're pictures of God. They're the way that God reveals himself. And he's doing it in his church today. But what happens if somebody comes into church and a little tribe... Or a family group goes, well, I'm not doing that. We're, not, we're, we're cool the way we are. What picture now does the church, I'm, excuse me, do, do they have of the church and of God? Oh, that's the way God works. I get mine, and that's all I need to worry about. Wrong picture of God. Powerful lessons here, aren't they? All right, let me see if I got all five of my questions. I don't think I did. Who is your Joshua, number one? Secondly, what would it look like in your life for God to say to you, get up, get ready? And you may know the very thing that's in your life right now that's paralyzing you. 
What would that look like in your life? Three, do you have the courage? And by the way, let me back up. There's one more thing I want to add to this. It's, it's one thing about having the courage to speak God's word. And I believe in that. And I believe we got to be able to say, when something's wrong, it's wrong. It also takes courage to speak words of faith. Anybody can sit and criticize and complain. That land doesn't look so good to me from what I can see. And I don't think we ought to go over there. I'm you. It takes courage to stand up in a group of people and go, come on, guys, let's go do it. Let's go take this land. It's going to be awesome because God says it's awesome. And I believe that. Now, come on, go with me. That also takes courage. Do you have that kind of courage to speak words of faith? Are you as much about the word as you've ever been? And is the church more about the whole than it is you? That's five good questions for you to go ponder this week as you read back through Joshua chapter 1 on our journey uh, to enter the promised land. Let's close out in prayer. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving your people caring for them in spite of rebellion, in spite of sin, in spite of weaknesses, you always provide a way to get us to the promised land. As God, you have provided in Jesus a way to get us to heaven. Help us, God, on that journey. Help us to learn as we're reading and studying about this journey the principles that are still true today that will get us home to be with you. We pray this in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Look forward to our midweek together. We're going to have a great time of worship together. See you guys on Wednesday night.